The year is 2016. The MCU was still seen as peak fiction, Deadpool proved that rated R superhero films could still work, and Batman v Superman was an omen to how bad the DCEU was going to be for years to come. Next time they shine your light in the sky, don't go to it. The bat is dead. Bury it. Oh, 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 shiver my timbers! Shut up, man! But while the superhero genre was in full swing, there were plenty other movies that simply didn't get much recognition since they were overshadowed by such juggernauts. And one of those movies was Cabin Fever. One of the greatest comedies of all time. <laughs> a remake of the 2002 film of the same name, it's really a wonder why this movie was even made. The original Cabin Fever wasn't exactly an amazing movie. It, I mean, it was okay. So why Cabin Fever of all the early 2000s horror movies to remake? Whatever the reason is, they did it. And in doing so, they crafted perhaps one of the worst horror movies of all time. It, it is truly spectacular. It's quick, stop the f quick what? Directed by a man simply known as Travis Z, who is known for such works as Witch Den and How Many Likes. Two short films that I have never heard anything about. And apparently he worked on Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. That's, that's not a good sign. But come on, it's safe to give this guy a chance, right? How bad could this movie really be? I know nobody cares about this movie, but to me, this is like The Room, or Sharknado, just one of those so bad it's good movies. And I'd like to share it with you here, so let's dive headfirst into Cabin Fever. Our feature presentation begins in the middle of the woods, where a weird hermit named Henry arrives home to find his totally real dog has died from some sort of unrecognizable disease. And to get this out of the way now, a whole lot of this video is going to be censored for obvious reasons. The hermit's dog sprays blood in his face, causing the hermit to scream hilariously. Pancakes! It's probably not a good idea to have your horror movie open up with the man shouting pancakes at the top of his lungs. But what do I know, I guess. And now we are introduced to our wonderful main cast. A group of friends consisting of Paul, Karen, Jeff, Marcy, and Bert. They're here to stay in a cabin in the woods for vacation, which is conveniently the surest way for a bunch of friends to die horribly in a horror movie. Uh, you're gonna love it. There's no professors, there's no papers, it's just peace and relaxation the entire time. And relentless pounding for like six days. <laughs> Don't care, plus didn't ask. Our heroes decide to supply up at a gas station in the middle of nowhere, where a small child in a bunny mask is used to try to scare the audience with spooky music. Just because you put spooky music behind something, that, that doesn't automatically make it scary. This is a problem that permeates the entire movie. This scene also introduces another constant throughout the entire movie. Bad acting. Take it easy. Don't you tell me how to raise my boy? So for basically no reason, the boy in the bunny mask, named Dennis, lunges at Paul and bites him on the hand. Oh, I get it. So this is how the first of the friends gets infected. That makes sense. Oh. Well then what was the point of this? Well you'll see how this weird kid biting people kinda comes back later. It's pretty dumb. Anyway, Paul and his buddies decide to completely underplay the fact that a child just bit Paul's hand deep enough to draw blood. They're a little upset, threatening to sue the kid's father. What are you trying to say exactly? What I'm saying is, that such an incident would result in a lawsuit, you may be held liable. I don't know nothing about that around here. But take a wild guess as to whether that happens or not. I like this little part where Karen he says she's gonna go get a first aid kit for Paul's hand. You okay? Yeah, I'll be fine as, as kids. Uh, I have a first aid kit in the car. I'll wrap it. Thanks. But then she just doesn't do it. She waits until they're all in the car like five minutes later. Also, for some reason, this happens. What? You want to give me one Whoa. good reason why you'd steal a Snickers bar? Huh? Would you believe me if I told you it was for the nougat? The nougat what now? So, does Bert's kleptomania come back at all? Nope. It does not. Another overused trope in this movie is jump scares. Really bad jump scares. It's always something that isn't remotely scary, but they put a loud sound effect behind it to make you jump. Ow! Jump, jump scare! It's, it's pretty lazy. So after a weird car ride scene where you can't hear what anybody's saying, but they play weird music behind it, they finally arrive at their cabin. 
Now I will say, this cabin is super nice. I would totally stay here, but I have no idea why any of these people even wanted to go. Well, I, I guess there's one reason. Relentless pounding for like six days. Don't care. A couple of them immediately complain about staying here, especially Bert, the best character. This dude has some of the funniest cringe gamer moments I've ever seen in a movie. Honestly, without Bert, this movie would be just unbearably boring. He dates the movie with video game references. No GTA 5, no Black Ops 2, no Stampy, no Minecraft, no- We live in society. He rolls around in the forest with his assault rifle that he brought because reasons. He's funny because you can tell how out of touch the writers were when it comes to a character like this. But I don't care at all, because it makes the movie way more enjoyable. Anyway, the other characters do generic horror movie friend group stuff. They swim, they make out, they have sex, and confess feelings to each other. How wholesome. While this is happening, the corny gamer boy goes out into the woods to do this. Danny, I'm coming up on your saddle. Frag out! <sighs> I think I just got a team kill, so I guess. Like, I'm not gonna lie, I used to do this type of thing too. When, when I was like, eight years old. But here we have a grown man in the woods pretending to throw frag grenades at imaginary enemies. Cause this is surely what every Call of Duty player does whenever they have to be away from their PlayStation for more than five minutes. Whatever Call of Duty is taken away from you, you gotta LARP in the woods by yourself. Well actually it turns out he isn't alone. Henry, the hermit from earlier, decides that he wants to join in on the fun. After shooting a man and leaving him there to bleed out and die like a true epic gamer, Bert goes back to the cabin to find Jeff and Marcy, putting out the small fires left over from the fire Bert started earlier for no reason. Seriously though, how old are you? We can't leave you alone for five minutes without you burning the place down? Hey, maybe this movie is more self-aware than I thought. That evening, the friends start another fire so they can sit around and force Paul to tell a traumatic story that he wasn't even involved in. No, no man, it's... It's too traumatic, I don't want to talk about it. Twelve seconds later... I used to go to this... bowling alley. Lenny Mead's Brighton Bowl, you remember it? Every weekend I would go there, either with my dad or for a birthday party or whatever. But one weekend I asked my dad if we were going. He said no, so the alley was closed. Some disgruntled employee was holding all the other employees at gunpoint. He tied each hostage to a chair and arranged them in a circle. Then after they've been gagged and beaten, this maniac breaks out a ball peen hammer and one by one smashes in the back of their heads. That sound all? This guy doesn't stop, he breaks out the fire axe, the alarm sounds, but he doesn't care. He hacks off all their limbs, dismembers them completely. Wow. That that actually sounds like a real horror movie. Out of nowhere, a brand new character jump scares his way into the scene. <gasps> now he has a regular name, but I don't care because he goes by Grim. But you can call me Grim. Grim like uh, Grimace or No. Just Grim. Like death. Like the Grim Reaper. This is a load of barnacles. And that name is much funnier. I don't know what the director was telling this guy to get this performance, but every word out of this man's mouth is either said in the most bizarre way possible or is very threatening for no reason. Same thing you guys are. Enjoying nature. Some of the best free climbing is right here in this valley. Now, why would our heroes allow this complete stranger to join their little campfire session, you may ask? No worries. I get it. I guess I'll just take this big bag of weed and smoke it all by myself. Oh, well, hey, oh, well, oh no, 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 sit down. Sit down. He presents them with a giant bag of weed that he doesn't give to them. Like, ever. And he never comes back after this scene, so I don't know why this guy exists. Sure, his dog, Dr. Mambo, comes back. His name's Dr. Mambo. But, but not Grimm, so what, what's the point of Grimm being here, guys? I should also mention now that this movie is very, very horny. At least in the beginning. Relentless pounding. Didn't ask. There's so many sexual innuendos, scenes of the characters flirting, making out, having sex. It's typical horror movie stuff, but this movie has it bad. Later that night, the group of chums decide to hang out in the cabin due to an incoming rainstorm, even though it never actually ends up raining. Thank you. Oh, uh, it must be the weed guy. 
Someone shows up at the door and they think it must be Grimm, returning to give them the bag of weed that they never got their grubby little hands on. But I already told you that Grimm doesn't come back, so... It can't be him. Much to everybody's surprise, it's actually Henry! The sick hermit from before that Bert shot with his amazing skills he cultivated through years of training. I won't even go into the tech specs on this beast because you couldn't handle it. You're gonna accidentally shoot one of us. Never happened, I have years of training. Now how this dude is alive despite the obvious skin-eating virus making him bleed out, as well as being shot, is is just beyond me. I don't know. It's bad enough that this blood-covered dude shows up at your door, but things get even more tense when he recognizes Bert from before. Yeah. He becomes belligerent, they close the door on him, all is well. Except for that Henry decides to steal the gang's car. But that's okay, because surely they didn't leave the keys in inside. <sighs> I know they're in the middle of nowhere, so the likelihood of somebody stealing their car is low, but this just still seems like an unnecessary risk to take, especially with one creepy weirdo calling himself the Grim Reaper already having found their cabin just that night. Well, instead of doing the same thing, like, I don't know, stopping him, they proceed to heavily damage the car. Paul beats it with a bat, and Bert shoots it with his gun. Sorry, his rifle. You brought a gun? Okay, firstly, it's not a gun. It's a rifle. There's even a moment where the hermit tries to get out of the car, but Paul swings at the door for no reason, making him get back inside. Now, what happens next defies all reason. You have a guy with a full auto assault rifle, and a guy with a baseball bat. But for some reason, Marcy grabs a bottle of lighter fluid and painfully sprays it all over Henry's body. At the same time, Jeff runs into the house and grabs a piece of firewood from the lit fireplace and somehow doesn't burn his hand. He comes back outside with said firewood as Henry exposes his lesion-covered chest, shocking everybody. Jeff, in his shocked state, drops the piece of firewood, igniting the lighter fluid and setting Henry ablaze. Henry runs off into the forest, never to be heard from again. Okay. So what was the point of the firewood? He didn't know Marcy was gonna douse the guy with lighter fluid, so what was Jeff's plan exactly? Why not just ask one of your armed buddies to deal with the threat instead of lighting a man on fire? Whatever the reasoning, after this debacle, the recently crowned murderers ruminate on whether or not to tell the police what happened. Report the accident. The key word here is accident. Yeah, officer. We, we sprayed a guy with lighter fluid and set him on fire by accident. It's at this point in the movie that you might realize the music is actually kind of good. The music was done by Kevin R Ripel, known for composing music for several video games. But most notably to me is his credit on Gears of War 1, and that game is full of bangers. So if nothing else, most of the music of this movie is actually pretty good. After all this is when we discover that everyone is getting infected via the water, and, and that's all fine and good. But then what was the point of the kid who bites people, or the hermit who gets infected by his dog? If they aren't how anyone gets infected, then why are they here? Also, spoiler alert, but Karen is actually infected. But the scene makes it seem as though she becomes infected after drinking the lake water. So was she just not infected before? Did swimming not infect her? It turns out Paul isn't infected until way later in the movie, but he swam with Karen. It, it just makes no sense. So the friends split up to go look for help with, uh, with little success. Bert and Jeff finally find a house. Uh, yeah, it looks kind of creepy. It looks creepy? How? It, it just looks like a normal house. In the barn near the house, they find an insane farmer lady that yells about how her pigs are infected. Now what am I supposed to do with a sick hog? Huh? Huh? I'm not about to eat this meat, would you? No. But then she just randomly turns into a normal person for no reason after they ask for help. Here I am, prattling on about my hog, and you just want to find somebody going to find you a mechanic. <laughs> and she does actually offer to help them, which probably would have stopped most of the nonsense and the rest of the movie from happening, but they decide to abandon the only hope of help that they have when they discover that Henry, the man they burned alive, is the farmer's cousin. 
crazy hermit guy. It, it wasn't Henry, was it? Like, I get that you guys might have some guilt, but this is literally your best chance to get out of here. She doesn't need to know that you brutally murdered her cousin. Back at the cabin, where Paul decided to stay behind with Karen, it turns out that a sheriff is actually waiting outside. Easy, easy. Remember kids, loud noise equals scary. Also, why did this insane cop lady do this stupid quick draw maneuver for no reason? Everyone in this movie is so extra. This cop in particular is, is a strange case. She has a scar that is never explained. She's extremely horny for no reason. Why don't you take your pretty little self back inside? Just relax, put your feet up, and uh, pop up in another 40. Now that girl is hot. Ah, okay, wow. She just speaks so strangely. It's like living in this area makes you speak like Shyamalan characters. What? No! She decides to just make a report, whatever that means, despite the fact that there was clearly a murder of some kind here, what with the blood-soaked car and everything. She says she'll get them a tow truck, and then leaves. Great. So even though the cop promised that she'd get them a tow truck, the guys decide to clean the car anyway. Now I told you that Dr. Mamba would come back, and I am nothing if not a man of my word. They clearly had no real way to make the dog look infected, so they just tossed some dust bunnies on him and called it a day. And he just stands there for no reason, other than to be spooky, I guess, before Marcy shoots at the dog to make him run away. Where'd you learn to shoot like that? I have two brothers. Also, you're not the only gamer here. Hey, what's up, gamers? This is just one of several pointless scenes involving this dog. After another group meeting where they once again talk about what to do, Jeff and Bert decides to fix the tire so they can leave in the morning. Now first of all, there's no way this dude knows how to change a tire. Dr. Mumbo shows up once again, apparently immune to the sound of gunfire this time. Now once more, this scene goes nowhere. They just fix the tire and forget about Dr. Mambo when Paul calls out to everyone to inform them that Karen is in fact infected. And Paul was just making out with her too, so I guess he's screwed. Also, she screams bloody murder now, but like, did it not hurt at all until just this second or what? I'm not dying like that. What are we dying? Yeah, guys, don't, don't let her hear you or anything. After finding out that she's infected, the rest of the group lock her in a shed outside for, say it with me, no reason. I get that they want to quarantine her, but could she not just quarantine in the bedroom she's already contaminated? And again, why is Paul not being quarantined? He just had his tongue in that girl's mouth and her blood on his hands. Put him in the shed too. Well, either way, they all decide to leave in the morning after Paul fails to find help when he is mistaken for a peeping Tom. What the hell are you doing? Whoa, whoa. It's time to stop! And wouldn't you know it, Dr. Mambo shows up yet again this time actually kind of looking infected, though. So wait, they could have just made him look infected the whole time? Then, then what was with the dust bunnies? You got the gun, shoot that thing. Uh, what if I miss? I mean, wounded animals are twice as dangerous. Well, everybody you've shot has been on accident, so that's honestly a fair reason for him to not want to shoot the dog. Their escape attempt does not go very well as Karen throws up blood everywhere. Let's put her in the back. I'm not getting in a car with her. Okay, then put her in the front with me, then. Why would you let her sit up front? It makes no sense. Put her in the trunk or something. During all this, Jeff decides to be a total jackass for no reason, refusing to get in the car. Oh, and Bird is infected now too. And this scares him so much that he drives away with the car, making things worse for, again, no reason. With the current turn of events, Jeff decides that he doesn't want to be in the movie, so he takes all of their beer and leaves. While Bert drives to who knows where, Paul takes the bloody clothes and th throws them in the lake. You know what, man, you, you deserve whatever happens to you. So Paul and Marcy, feeling helpless, decide to do what horror characters in bad situations do best, have sex. And mid-sex, it turns out Marcy is infected. How shocking. Bert makes it to the gas station from the beginning of the movie where he asks the guy who caught him stealing earlier to get him a doctor. He, for some reason, agrees, leaving Bert outside with his kid. That this, this should end well. Pancakes. Pancakes. Wait, hold on. How does this kid know pancakes? How does he know this random hermit's dog? 
Well, whatever. The kid bites Bert and infects himself. This causes the dad and his hick buddies to get really upset and go on a Fast and Furious style chase scene to catch Bert and murder him and his friends. Back at the cabin, Marcy decides to take a bath and shave her legs. Does this really seem like the best time to do this? Well, of course, the Razor confirms she has the flesh-eating virus, and the movie treats us to a gore porn scene where Marcy peels her own skin, including ripping her nipple off. She walks outside and is eaten alive by Dr. Mambo in his first scene of actually doing something. <laughs> Meanwhile, Paul is in the woods looking for Jeff, but he finds someone else instead. Okay, how is this dude alive? He has a flesh-eating virus, he was shot, he was burned alive, what, what is this dude on? Well, it turns out his weakness is drowning because that's how Paul finally finishes this dude off. After doing so, Paul finally realizes that the water is the source of the infection. Which, which doesn't really matter, because he threw contaminated clothes into the water previously, so, like, if, if it wasn't contaminated before, it sure is now. Thanks a lot, Paul. After finding Marcy's only remaining part of her body, Paul hears Dr. Mambo having another feast on Karen in the shed. He finally manages to kill the dog only because it's less than 10 feet away from him. So this is the most iconic scene from the original movie, where Paul has to put Karen out of her misery. And, and this movie butchers it. Not, not that I'm surprised. The assault rifle is, shockingly, out of ammo, leading Paul to realize that he has to bludgeon Karen with a shovel to finish her off, just like in the original. But, for some reason, he just, like, splits her face in half and then just stops. Like, she's suffering even more now, but he just stops. Instead of using the shovel, he for some reason sets her on fire and burns her alive. Yeah, man, she really sounds thankful for you putting her out of her misery in such a painless way. What a guy. Alright, I gotta wrap this up. Bert finds his way back to the cabin. The Hicks finally kill him, but they don't shoot Paul for some reason. After seeing his friend die, he grabs the assault rifle and, and shoots them all. Even though it was, it was just out of ammo. Whatever, the Hicks are gone, Jeff is nowhere to be found, and Paul crashes the Hicks car into a tree after finding out he is also infected, which really shouldn't have been a surprise at this point. He then finds the cop lady and gets upset at her for not getting him a tow truck. She's given permission by her superior officer to kill Paul, but she lets him go, giving him directions to the road. He doesn't find it. The next morning, Jeff shows up back at the cabin to find all of his friends super dead. He starts hooping and hollering because he's the only survivor, but after he finds out he is also infected, he is sniped by the cop lady. For, for no reason. In the original, this actually made more sense, but whatever, I don't care. Dennis finds Paul's body in the forest, the credits roll, and a cleanup crew comes to clean up. And that's Cabin Fever, the 2016 remake. This movie is truly awful. Most of the funny stuff happens in the first 30 minutes, and the rest of it is just horror schlock until the credits. But that first 30 minutes, it's, it's really funny. If you made it all the way, thank you. If you enjoy this kind of content, please feel free to comment, like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Again, thank you for watching.